I wish you could see what's outside my window right now. I think you'd be out there in a heartbeat if you could see what I'm looking at. Oh God, what are you looking at? They're paving the street. So we have this entire street freshly paved, nice dude. and black, dude. I could probably smell it from here, but you know what I'm thinking. Gabby, go get my skates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. That's a dream come true. It's funny because growing up down here in South Florida, Miami, uh, I would always go to South Beach. I mean, that was my jam. Yeah, I grew up in the 90s, and that was kind of like the thing to do. You put on your cassette player, you know, you go out to South Beach, you put on your rollerblades, you see all the high-waisted bikinis, the women uh, skating, the men skating. I mean, bandanas were cool then. Uh, so just you're, you're toying with my emotions here when you say fresh pavement. I know. I was going to say, can you smell it from here? Like, can you can you get uh, a whiff of that? Because, dude, it is fresh. It memories, literally man. just went down last night. Memories. Memories right there. I mean, there was – I used to train a lot on the road. Uh, on inline speed skating, I used to train a lot, like, chasing bike pelotons and stuff. And, you know, when we would – one of the courses we would – I would skate one of the golf courses down, down south in Kendall – uh, and I would chase the Peloton of bikes and it was kind of rough in some areas. And then there's these patches of like fresh road. And it was like, everything just becomes quiet. You're just skating behind the pack and it's just different feel, man. So it's, it's a feeling I miss. So thanks for the, uh, the memory. Yeah. Well, you know who used to live down the road from here? Um, Lee Mazzilli. I had a, uh, I hung out with him via zoom uh this past off season man he what a great guy that's his story if you know for the people out there if you don't know the lee mazzilli story that's a story to look up yeah and and he himself which we're going to talk a lot about your just incredible career but he was a eight-time junior national champion in, in speed skating so i haven't seen him outside just yet going back and forth because i'm pretty sure you just moved to florida but uh <laughs> i'm sure him. you would take up <laughs> take up the pavement but yeah man so let's just get right to it like when you were five years old, you kind of touched on it before, but that's when you uh, you picked up the, the the rollerblades and you just started going around town in Miami where you're from. But like, do you remember that that moment when you got that first pair? Ah, uh, man, I just remember it was Christmas time uh, when I got them. I couldn't tell you when I put them on or what I did for the first time when I put them on. That's how young I was. Uh, I just remember, you know opening the car door uh, and smelling the ocean breeze and, um, you know, just kind of shredding the streets of South beach. Uh, the attention kind of, you know, passed along the attention and I've made some noise enough to be sponsored at that young age by a skate shop. That's my son. <laughs> uh, and man, it just, it, it's funny. Cause I feel like I got recruited in a sense um, at young age, you know, these two ladies kind of stopped me. And my parents and they told me, told them that I should try the sport of speed skating and I fell in love with it. That's so cool because like there's so many different things that you could do at that age. And I'd imagine that a lot of people don't pick up rollerblading until later on in life. But that's cool that you're introduced to it by getting that Christmas gift in 1994. And like you said, just going all around Miami. And, and it was just for fun. Like it wasn't like I had plans. I mean, no one in Miami really skates period <laughs> anymore especially ice skate um but i knew that uh if i wanted to ever become an olympian which was kind of solidified around that age group where i really started competing nationally um i had to make a transition to the ice to do that and no one knows what that is down here uh, just to find ice time alone was extremely difficult and i had to do a lot of cross training between cycling and inline speed skating and uh, it was it was challenging, but this all happened at the same time that I was playing baseball, uh, which is. Uh. That blows my mind. I mean, obviously, we all know that Miami, there's so many baseball players that come out of there, Florida, warm weather states. So a lot of people are in the ball field. So the fact that you're able to like kind of mix in a, a completely different other sport. And you said that two women had discovered you as a, as a rollerblader. And uh, somebody else who was very influential at like your young childhood age was Jennifer Rodriguez, who was a Cuban and American Olympic athlete. 
And uh, she also has a really cool name. I know yours is Eddie the Jet. She's got Miami uh, Ice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. yeah. You got two no, cool no, nicknames. Jenny. <laughs> oh man, Jenny, Jenny was awesome. So Jenny was the one that kind of made my dreams a potential reality for me. Uh, I saw her do the transition into the ice and uh, just make basically make a name for herself and do what I wanted to do. And so she made it, she made that dream like re attainable. You know, she had a huge influence in my skating career at that age uh, when I was young and, and still to today. You know, when I do talk to Jenny, it's you know, it's good memories that we have because she would always come back down when, when she would visit her family and stuff. She would always put on skates and come practice with us. And it's, you know, it's been great to have having such a great role model like her. Yeah. And then eventually, which we'll get to you, you became the first male Cuban American athlete in the Winter Olympics. And like, that's kind of cool because she was the first to do that uh, female wise for female. herself, which is like, do you talk about coming for, full circle? Yeah. Then like, it's nuts because you win all these national titles when it came when it came to it was inline skating correct inline skating yeah i did uh yeah my first man, national championship was in 1996 i was six years old wow and it was my very first competition there's a a division called junior olympic which is called jail abbreviated and uh it's like the beginner class right but it was my first championship if you medal in this division you then go to the regular class of competition. So, you know, I, I basically advanced to regular com competition at a young age and started winning all sorts of national championships. And then I was just like, I was s s uh, one of those kids that just had a thrill for speech. And uh, it was like the perfect sport for me. <laughs> I'm thinking about this because you're saying like six years old and just becoming a national champ then your son who was just born recently that he's, he's got like five years to, uh, to get ready to be on daddy level right there. <laughs> oh man. He's already starting to do squats. I got him on a training regimen here. <laughs> what's, what's crazy about your story to me is that when I was doing research, I'm like going back and forth from all the years and it's like a seesaw when you'd be skating versus playing baseball. So you get all the success in this one sport and then you're like, all right, now I want to go play baseball. So what kind of made you want to initially change to playing baseball and kind of focus on that? Oh, man. Um, so I, I always, yeah, like you said, I always juggled both sports. I, uh, I didn't quite know. There's, it's funny because like a lot of the decisions I've made in my life uh, leading up to high school was always you know, depending on the importance of what was coming next. So if I had a major ice skating competition or a national championship, either inline short track or long track and, or a major, you know, travel team baseball tournament, it just depended on what, what was more important at the time. But there was a point in middle school, like around that uh, 10 to 12 year old Eddie uh, that he was finishing school uh, playing with the middle school baseball team, going to skating practice from five to seven. And then from eight to nine 30, he would have travel team practice. And in between all those car, in between the car rides, it was homework time. You know, I did that for a majority period of my lifetime. Um, and then once high school came around, man, I'm not going to lie to you. There was, when I made decisions to go to one sport, it was like, okay, I'm going to quit the other one that I'm leaving, you know, but then these opportunities kind of come around and, you know, you can call it fate. You can call it whatever you may. Uh, I just felt like I had to jump on these opportunities and, you know, I've always listened to my heart and, and there's one thing I've always said, I never wanted to regret anything. So if I would have never jumped back and forth, I probably would be sitting right here probably not even talking to you, but let's say hypothetically speaking, if I was talking to you, I probably would be regretting a lot. All right. So here you are, you're like the greatest at what you do with skating. You love baseball. So like, I know you said that you kind of like, just like go based off like what your heart's telling you, but yeah. how much different was what your heart was telling you versus what other people were telling you? Like, was there any coach or family member that was trying to like put you into one 
direction because you were so great at like both of them. You know what I mean? Like anybody yeah. trying to steer you towards like baseball and baseball only, you know? Yeah. So there was one, one time in my, in my life, I'm not going to give you kind of uh, an age range. Cause I'll probably kind of give out around who this might be in reference to, but there was a point in my life that I did listen to someone and it wasn't a family member. It was external. And this person basically gave me an ultimatum, uh, which I took. And it was not the right decision to make at the time. And uh, that, that was one of my regrets is listening to this person. And after that, it never happened again. It was the, the, tune, the tune to my own guitar, the beat to my own drum, because um, I knew the support system that I had behind me. Uh, and, you know, if they wanted to support me, then they can come along on this ride. And if they didn't, then, you know, there's no room in, in this life for me, for you. Well, it sounds like it was a good live and learn situation because had that not happened, you wouldn't want that to happen even further along down the road. So it, just knowing that you like your gut instinct was the best way to go about things is awesome. So like now you're in high school and you're playing baseball and it, it, like, you become a switch hitter, which dude, oh, that's a different story. <laughs> yeah. This is all blowing my mind. Like an Olympic athlete playing baseball, switch hitting, like, dude, what? This is crazy, man. So didn't switch in high school. Didn't really switch hit my entire life really until, uh, I showed up to my junior college that you walked on. Yes, yeah, so I was at the time living in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, training full time with the U.S. national team. Uh, and I was having a lot of knee issues that year of 2010, 9 and 10, where I didn't make the Vancouver Olympics. So I decided to take a break from skating and, you know, basically go to school, play some ball, uh, just get away from it. And I called the community college baseball coach, Salt Lake community college baseball coach at the time, which was DG Nelson. And he told me to come on by. He was in disbelief that I was even a speed skater trying to play baseball. But anyways, he told me to come by. He was like, yeah, whatever. Uh, I met him and he told me, all right, go to shortstop and let's do sketch a couple ground balls here and there. And within 15 minutes, he brought me in and told me that I was going to be a starting shortstop the following season. And, uh, you know, that, that team was pretty epic. We ended up being ranked number one the, in the, in the country for a while. I mean, we made it all the way up to regionals, but we lost the final game to go to the world series. And, um, but it was, it was a good little hiatus I had there. Uh, but it was back to business, which was skating. You know, I've had, all, I had all the support from him. He always said that, if I wanted to come back and play ball, that there's always going to be a spot there for me. But I had a, I had an Olympics to go to. <laughs> That's right. And you even said too that like, at, there's at one point where your knees were just like bothering you like crazy. Yeah. You had a pretty big surgery, and then like you, you were what like bedridden for over a month at least, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I finally made the decision after going through all sorts of PRP. Uh, stem cell, bone marrow, everything injected into my knees. Uh, I finally made the decision to get uh, bilateral patella tendon surgery. Uh, basically, they just went into both knees at the same time, and which was like, I think it was close to an eight-hour surgery. Uh, and I was bedridden for more than a month. Um, it was a very depressing time for me because – I didn't know. You know me yet. I also didn't know my wife yet. You heard that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't want to chime in on that one. But the doctor. That was, that was actually perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> well played. Basically, the doctors couldn't give me uh, a clear answer on whether they were confident enough that I'd be able to skate again. Uh, that was scary for me because, you know, this was a dream that I sacrificed majority of my life. Uh, to accomplish and you know not having anyone to back me up really was was a pretty scary time and I learned how to play guitar just to get my mind off things I 
I wrote a lot. I watched a lot of movies. I mean, I was peeing into a bedpan because I couldn't get up. I wasn't going to the bathroom regularly, obviously, because of the pain, the pain uh, killers. Uh, it was, it was rough. It was rough, but you know, I made myself a couple promises during that time. And you know, it's funny cause you know, I look back and I don't know if I would be the athlete I am today, or I don't know if I would have been able to accomplish what I've accomplished today if I didn't go through that. Your doctor told you, he's, he's like, yo, I don't know if you're going to be able to compete at a, at an, at an elite level skating wise. And I don't even know if you're going to be able to play baseball again. So what types of thoughts went through your mind while you're bedridden, just trying to come back? Uh, man, you know, they say that an, an athlete dies twice in their lifetime. And, you know, once is when the, their career ends. And uh, the other one, obviously, is when it's our time to go. Uh, but I was already like, I was so depressed that I would have to live a normal life. Uh, which, you know, it looking at it now, it's, it wouldn't have been bad at all. Like, I look at my family and I thank God every day, you know, like this is, uh, this, this, everything that I'm doing outside of my family right now, it's like icing on the cake for me. Uh, but, you know, just like having to find a job and going to school and studying something, you know, I've, I've only really known to be an athlete. I never, I, and my, my mom to this day, I tell her, and she still doesn't quite grasp the concept. I never had intentions of going to school because I knew where I wanted to go. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I wanted to accomplish and I was willing to do whatever it took. The knee surgery was the first step. It was 2012 and I was like, the Olympics are in February of 2014. I need to get surgery now. And found the best doctor we could find in Miami. And he was like, okay, we'll do one knee. And then I said, no, we're doing both knees. Uh, I don't have time. Like, do it. He goes, okay, well, you're not going to be able to be, be able to move. You're not going to be able to this. I'm like, I don't care. Let's do both knees. You know, my parents had to, if I had to go to the toilet, my parents had to freaking, you know, I had both arms around them. They had to drag me to the toilet. I had to put my feet up on buckets. It was, dude, it was a challenging time. But I learned so much from that. Like that, going through all that kind of told me that I didn't have limitations. Um, and it didn't matter. Like, like pain is pain. And uh, I was willing to work as hard as possible to get to Olympic shape. And so when I touched the ice, it was like a year maybe before the Olympic Games. So I had about 10 months to train before Olympic trials after not touching the ice for three and a half years. <laughs> wow. Because between baseball, the knee surgery, the recovery, that took almost three – that took yeah it took majority of three years did you end up still playing the guitar and and it's kind oh, of a yeah. small detail in all this but uh the reason why i bring the guitar back up is that having i've i've been in a similar situation before i got in a bad car accident and i was in a wheelchair for almost two months so kind of like similar time as you uh broken leg broken arm bedridden um you find out who your real friends are you know the ones who are willing to tie your shoes you mentioned it's hard to go to the bathroom kind of sweat when you go take a shower or something like that because you're trying to get into the shower and you don't want to slip while you're in there so I totally understand where you're coming from but playing the guitar had to have been so therapeutic for you and, and just kind of like a way for you to get your mind off of what the actual situation was so like how instrumental no pun intended was it like picking up a hobby like that during that time because because you could have gone through so many different routes I know as as um, man, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like drastic, but it really saved my life. Uh, it, I had nothing else to do. I was going through a heartbreak. I basically thought that, you know, I was a star two sport player. Uh, I just felt like everything was taken away from me and I had nothing going for myself. Uh, so I'm, living on the floor of my parents living room at 22 years old with 
no, no, no school really. Cause I've, I've only gone to school for a year. Um, and I just, I know nothing that really fired me up to do in my future other than be an athlete. So I was, if it wasn't for the guitar, I, I mean, honestly, I, I would have gone crazy. I, mean, I don't know. It's a sensitive, sensitive topic to talk about. I've never really gotten so deep into it. Like I said, just being in a similar situation, you're just trying to find that one thing that just kind of like keeps you going and something that you love and something that you're passionate about. How many songs did you learn on the guitar? <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say, I kind of went a little bit of a different route. I, uh, <laughs> I'm not very musically talented, but, uh, yeah, was but I. <laughs> I own a guitar now. <laughs> I actually, I ended up doing something similar to this where just kind of like pursuing my passion and just like living the dream of, of still being able to work in sports. And I would just try to get in touch with as many guys who I didn't know just over their social media and just try to establish relationships with them. Because if you're in bed, like, you know, for that six to eight weeks, you're not able to do anything else really. So you got to use your hands. You got to use your mind and just try to find anything therapeutic to get you through those times. And it's had like such a lasting impact because I'm here doing this today and same exact thing for you. If you don't pick up that guitar, like I said, there's so many different options you could have gone, whether it was like that feel sorry for yourself. You right. said that it's there's the, like the painkillers in the pictures, medications. There's, I mean, there's even like, alcohol. you could choose so many different things. So many rabbit holes. And you're sitting there all day by yourself. Right. And if you don't have that outlet, like you can fall into these spiraling situations, which is what you're explaining. It's so true. Uh, but that's what the guitar was for me. I had no idea what a guitar chord looked like, you know, and I, I started from basics. YouTube became my best friend and I learned over 30 songs at one point, forgot them all, but I learned at one point 30 songs uh, and man, it was like the only thing, like my parents were even like, what, how? It's like, because I had, I always had the mindset, like if I put myself to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. Yeah. There's no other option for me. Like I'm going to do it until I get it. And I've always, I was always like that as a kid, whether I was shooting hoops in my backyard, um, you know, I always told I'm not going inside until I drain five threes in a row, you know, like an, an hour and a half later, then my mom would be like, where the hell were you? <laughs> but I was like that. I was, I was always an extremist when it came to these things. And um, man, but I'm glad everything's okay with you. No, likewise, man. And, and, and hey, we're doing this together. And and yeah. to that point, the fact that we're like creating this this podcast, this audio, this video, just trying to have a positive impact. I think it says a lot about like that situation that we were both in, because that's also another time where you start to realize how precious life is and how you should like not take anything for granted and how you should say hello to anybody, whether it's somebody on the street, whether it's a cashier at the at the grocery store, it, just say hi, just like be be nice. You know what I mean? So the butterfly effect from that one very down experience is just so powerful long-term and yeah, sure. People could look at you funny one day and just be like, why is this kid smiling so much? Like what's wrong with Eddie? He's in such a good mood, you know, but it's just like, dude, I'm in a great mood because I'm here, you know? Exactly, man. It's, it, and you said it like, you never know when it's going to be the last time you see someone. I mean, we just had a catastrophic event here in, uh, in Miami beach Surfside. Uh, you know, a building collapsed. Uh, I'm not hundred percent sure what the body count is right now, but it just collapsed in the middle of the night, an eight story apartment building with people sleeping inside, you know, like, dude, it's, it's, it's hard to look at situations like that and, and really like feel bad for yourself and, and not make the effort to go out of your way and say hi to someone or when someone does look down, ask them what's wrong. Um, you know, it's obviously the easy route to avoid them. And don't get me wrong. I've fallen guilty to this too. I've done the ignoring, uh, but it really, sometimes it makes a difference. And, mm -hmm. you know, like I, at the time really needed someone to be like, are you okay? And, uh, you know, you, like you said, you find out who your true friends are when the lights aren't on you and, you know, you're not getting out new podcast and it's, uh, it's really teaches you who you are as a person. Yeah. And now as we sit here talking, 
you, you yourself, you can look around the room. You got a beautiful baby, beautiful wife. I mean, dude, this is the dream right here. And, and you're doing something that you love. Like, Absolutely. this is what it's all about, you know? I love you too, baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so really now good. you go through, uh, you go through all your PT, which by the way, my wife's a PT. So she'll appreciate all that hard work that you put towards getting back onto the ice. Oh, man. God knows who, how many, uh, people don't actually do their uh, reps at home or whatever they they get told to do to feel oh, better, yeah. but, oh, <laughs> but, yeah. but you did them and then you ended up back on the ice. So now we're at the 2014 winter Olympics. Like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> know, right? like insane, man. It literally yeah. like, at, not like, even, uh, not even 16 months ago. I'm, too, I'm in 2014 here. Not even 16 months ago, I was crying in the living room with my parents, and I'm wearing the red, white, and blue, walking through opening ceremonies with 70,000 people, you know, with eyes on me. And it's, dude, it, it, there was days I wanted to quit skating. That, I'm not going to lie. There was days I just, I didn't think that I could physically do it at that level. And I stuck with it, man. I did the extra work. I put in the extra hours. My coaches thought I was absolutely crazy, but I knew where I wanted to go and I did. And it was the best suffering of my life because it was like walking through opening ceremonies. Like I was having flashbacks of what <clears throat> certain events that I've had to go through uh, in my skating career to get to that point, to be like, wow, I just made it to the Olympics. Like it is surreal. Like I had to video. I, I was telling, I'm telling my wife here before, like, like I had to video everything because I knew I was going to forget everything because like I was on such a, a high at the Olympics because of everything that I sacrificed, everything my parents, my family sacrificed from moving to, to the United States from a different country to give themselves an opportunity, which then gave me opportunity to then freaking travel all over the country, then traveling all over the world uh, from South Florida, like to get to the winter Olympics as a kid born and raised of Cuban immigrants <laughs> from Miami. Uh, it's pretty surreal, man. It's, you know, I owe it all, all to them. And you got to take home that silver medal, which, I can only imagine the thoughts running through your mind as you're standing on the podium or like even before the race too, or the relay, because like you just, you have those flashbacks of being bedridden. You have those flashbacks of all the long days in the gym, rehabbing PT. You have so many different things going on through your head that at that time, it's just like beating somebody in a race is nothing compared to any of this other stuff. But once I get that W, once I get that medal, dude, time to pop yeah. the bottles. Yeah, exactly. I mean, but it's funny because like in the world of short track, it's it's the land of unpredictable, un unpredictability. <laughs> it's you never know what's going to happen. You can be the strongest, the fastest, the most skilled skater out there and still not win a race. Uh, and that's what's crazy about the sport. But I knew that I prepared to the best of my ability. There's nothing outside of that that I could have done. And, you know, once I stepped on the line, it, it was like more of like let fate take its course, uh, which I honestly live by that. I honestly like believe that with hard work comes opportunity, you know, because we all get presented opportunities at certain points in our life. And we never know when those opportunities might be. but if we constantly prepare, which then comes the consistency of preparation, you know, if we put in the reps, which I think is the key to success is repetition. You know, we eventually set ourselves up for a positive outcome because we're prepared. When that opportunity does come, we seize it. And, you know, that's why I truly believe I've had so much, what people may seem luck on my side with baseball. It's like, no, Motherfucker, excuse my language, but no. No, no, you're good. I worked, I worked my ass off for this. Like, I knew what I was weak at. I knew what I needed to improve. I knew who was around me. Like, I studied. I, there's no way that you were going to outwork me or out, uh, outsmart me. 
because I knew who was around me. I knew, and I only surrounded myself with guys that wanted to work. Um, and yeah, I sacrificed a little bit of uh, social life, but I know there's time for that because this is what I want to do, man. This is, this is it. This is like, I've, I've had such an unbelievable ride. And I mean, I'm, I'm going to look back when I'm old and I'm going to be like, fuck yeah. <laughs> Yo, you could do that even right now, man. Right As you're now, saying this, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, though. That's the perfect segue, though, because I was going to say the next boss move that you made was uh, turning pro in baseball. So for everybody at home, you are hearing correct. Eddie won an Olympic medal at the Winter Olympic Games in 2014, street skating. And then in 2014, signs a deal with the Chicago White Sox, goes, plays one season, then the your first full season in the White Sox organization, <laughs> like dude, if you weren't fast enough on the ice, you end up stealing fifty something bags in the first full season, and the next year you steal like another forty. Like, man, oh, Eddie the Jet. Oh. If you weren't the Jet going forty miles per hour on the ice, you're the Jet going around <laughs> the bases. And dude, this guy did his homework. <laughs> That, this guy did oh, homework. That, that's pretty good, man. That's <laughs> no, good. Uh, no, like I said, I respect it. I respect, I respect your story big time, man. So I want to do what I can to like share it and, and be a platform because, dude, I, I'm I'm so inspired by all this. And I, like, yeah, I'm not going <laughs> to – maybe I'll go out onto the pavement and, and roll it later on that pavement. I'm not going to – but like I'm going to try to – I got to order some skates. <laughs> But like uh, I, 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 I do know that mentality wise and like I can apply certain things that you're saying and that all the listeners out there and the viewers are going to do the same exact thing so that they could try to be them best selves because you are a, like proof that you can do anything that you put your mind to injury or, or anything like mentality wise like dude you got it man you, you end up crushing baseball and, and you're still a switch hitter like what. Yeah, and even well, though it took you an hour and a half to get five three pointers, I'm sure if, if you really tried, by the end of the day, you could at least row. be in the G That's League. The hard yeah, part. <laughs> in a row. <laughs> oh man! Uh, but dude, um, you know what? A lot of people don't know is I started switch hitting in college because in college I learned how to switch hit. I wasn't very good at it, uh, and then right after the Olympics ended in when was that? February, again, February, March, sorry. I knew I wanted to go back to baseball. And <laughs> I love that you just flipped the switch so quickly. Yeah. I, um, I, I like, dude, I just, I just won an Olympic silver medal. Like the last thing I wanted to do was go back to skating and wait another four years. So I just wanted to take a break. Right. Cause I didn't know I was going to do baseball professionally immediately. So I was like, ah, Let's play baseball again. I contacted my college coach again. Hey, what's up? I'm back. <laughs> and uh, he goes, dude, you're 24 years old. You're not coming to college. Let's try and get you pro workouts and see what happens. And I did that. And we set up workouts. I traveled to Jacksonville. I traveled to Tampa. I traveled to Arizona to do pro workouts. Um, I got invited to do a Marlins, one at Marlins Park, uh, well, which is now Lone Depot's Park, but uh, and dude, in August, which was not even four months after the Olympics, I get a phone call from the Chicago White Sox. And obviously it was for a pack of ketchups, but it was my opportunity, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I told my parents and I told, you know, my mentor at the time, Carlos Castillo, who played for the Chicago White Sox as well as a pitcher. Um, I told him, doesn't matter who calls. I am taking the very first one. And I did. As soon as they called, yes, let's go. I was on a flight in two days after that. Two days after that, I was on a flight, moved my entire life from – I still had stuff in Utah because I was training there. I came back to Miami for three and a half months, and I was on a flight to Arizona. And that's where my pro career started, man, right away. I was 30 pounds lighter than what I – than what I uh, debuted as with the Marlins. Uh, it, it's nuts to think about that. I I gained 30 pounds of muscle, and it all was upper body. And little did the people in Birmingham, Alabama, know that they were going to get the best two sports star since uh, since oh, Michael Jordan Birmingham. to come through there in, oh, in 2016. Oh, 
like, dude, like it, it's, it's crazy to me that, uh, you just been able to accomplish all this. And I think, uh, like, so you're with the white Sox for a little bit, but yeah, then eventually you got traded to Miami, yeah. right. In 2019, there was like something fishy about 2019 for me. Um, so I signed my pro contract 2014. I was already in AAA in 2016 and at the end of 2016. And, uh, you know, like that's when I really decided, okay, I'm going to take baseball seriously. I'm not going to make a jump back. Like, that's it. Like, this is it. If my career ends, maybe, maybe I'll go back to skating, but man, to go back to skating at, 26 27 and have to re rebuild my base again at that age is, is would be really tough so i was ready ready to let go of skating completely uh after i got called up to AAA or i went up through the system so fast 2019 comes around and once again uh, you know i get called into the office and i get told you know basically that if i'm going to go to AAA again and but i'm not going to be on the squad yet they're going to put me on the phantom list like i did in 2018 mm -hmm. and and i was like man honestly like just let me go already <laughs> um and i was like yeah but there's interest of other teams we put your name we put your name on the on the trading block and we got some hits and stuff like that and the miami Mons were the team that you know wanted me the most so i got traded in spring training and dude had a hell of a year in 19, I mean, had a couple setbacks <laughs> with a broken hand and, but that's nothing at this point, a broken hand. Yeah, I know. Right. It's funny. Cause like, I always felt like my back was, has always been against the wall, but it's like where I'm comfortable. And everything just played so well in the end, because you ended up making your MLB debut in 2020 with Miami Marlins. And like, you're from Miami. Like, I don't right. think you could have scripted this any better. Dude, I, I mean, can you even make this up? <laughs> I, Hell no. Yeah, just the journey that I've had the absolute pleasure of being a part of has been an absolute blessing, man. It's I, I couldn't, no way in hell could I ever tell you that this was going to happen, you know? I, I always dreamed, and I mean dreamed, about going to the Olympics and stepping up to the plate Olympian Eddie Alvarez and the bases are loaded with two outs and I hit the that'd be the icing on the cake right I hit the winning uh, home run <laughs> hey you but, still uh, got time man you got another 10 years yeah but that's like that's how I was man like I knew I always wanted to be an Olympian and I always knew I wanted to be a baseball player and like that just always stuck and I was willing to do whatever it took um, but the journey has been nuts absolutely nuts do you know that weird stat that stat, that Jim Thorpe stat, Jim like Thorpe. you're the. I don't know his career, like. Dude, it's so it's so long ago. It was like the early 1920s. So you're like the first dude, uh, who oh, is the man. first Winter Olympic <laughs> athletes and first non baseball Olympian since Jim Thorpe to play Major League Baseball. Early 1900s, dude. We're talking like. Yeah. That's... Titanic time period. Like that, <laughs> that's that's I mean, how long yeah. ago it was. Yeah, that, that was a long time ago, man. That's pretty – yeah, I mean, someone told me that stat, uh, and that's really, really unbelievable, honestly. And uh, I think a, one that would, like, top that would be the – you know, I have a thing for the Olympics. Like, it's, it's almost like an obsession. But it would be – I would be the number sixth athlete ever in Olympic history to medal in both – season olympics and the number three athlete in the u.s and that that's one that i really want that's that's the one i really want and it's definitely possible now because you got the summer olympics yeah and you're on the baseball squad which i'm not i will i'm not sure the timing of the release of this episode but depending upon when you're listening to this, and I'll do a quick edit when it comes out. Here's the quick edit, and a little bit of a spoiler alert. Team USA ended up placing second, earning Eddie Alvarez a silver medal in Tokyo, making him just the sixth athlete ever to medal in both the Summer and Winter Olympic Games. The last time an American did this was way back in 1932. 
And the icing on the cake for Eddie? He was chosen to be the U.S. flag bearer at the Tokyo Olympics opening ceremony. All right, back to keep swinging with easily one of the best athletes in the world ever to compete. But dude, like, yeah, so you have such a great shot to make history right now. And you got a great squad, man. You got the Todd Father, Todd Frazier on there, Homer Bailey, oh, Edwin you know Jackson, it. yourself. Like, dude, it it's it's possible, man. It's like this close. I tell you what, I went into qualifiers a little nervous, <clears throat> you know, because, you know, the, obviously, you know, these guys have had epic careers in the major leagues, but these guys still got it. <laughs> like, they got it. And I like they opened my eyes. I'm like, damn, damn, this is impressive to watch. You know, like how these guys don't have jobs in the big leagues still is like mind blowing to me. But uh, yeah, dude, we got a hell of a squad. It's a great mix between uh, vets and young talent. And I mean, young talent. Um, I mean, these guys from, uh, what is it? Jaron, 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 uh, Jaron and, and uh, Tristan Casas alone. I mean, these, these guys are studs. Uh, so, you know, leading up to the games, I mean, I know these guys are doing work. I've been keeping up with them. They're doing work in the minors and I've been talking with Todd a little bit and he's, you know, he just built his own cage because that that's how serious he's taking this, which only motivates me more to do whatever I can to do my part. Um, Cause again, ultimate goal is gold medal. I love how humble you are because like you're the Olympic athlete, you have the medal, you have the experience, but like you're, you're trying to learn from the people who you're surrounded with, which is just awesome. Cause I'd, oh, I'd imagine that oh, a lot oh, of the people are trying to ask you questions like, Hey, what's it like being at the Olympics and stuff. So like, has that happened a lot? Have people come to you asking like, Hey, what can I expect at, at an event? Cause this is the summer Olympics and you were in the winter Olympics, but I bet they're pretty similar in terms of preparation and, and just like that elite level of com competition. Right. Uh, so I, I have been asked what to expect. Uh, I've lived it. So I kind of have, you know, that little bit of advantage of what to expect. There's, so it won't be as noisy for me as it will be uh, for most. I've had to tell them like what to pack, what to bring necessities, uh, you know, what to expect the gear, um, what travel is going to be like getting to our venue, uh, what to expect when we walk opening ceremonies. I don't know if we will, but I mean, I get to relay, you know, the, me the, what my experience was there, you know, and it's, it's, it's great for them because, you know, then it gives them an idea of what to expect and how much they're going to be standing on <laughs> and, and up on their feet. And uh, it kind of gives me an opportunity to like relive some moments, man. It's it's a it's a win win. I think it's a little selfish, you know, but a win win for sure. For everybody out there listening, how can they keep in touch with you, follow along your journey, and just watch you crush life? Oh man, I'm so. What are I, the uh, yeah? The handles? So I'm, I like I, like you got to bear with me. I'm really bad at being active on social media, just because how like passionate I become with certain things in my life uh but instagram is eddie alvarez 90 eddie with a y and same as twitter eddie alvarez 90 yeah man follow along if you want to be a part of the journey i'm fired up i'm sure everybody at home is fired up so eddie thank you so much for your time and good luck with the rest of your career man i'm sure we'll do this again dude i i appreciate it i hope you invite me again man because this has been absolute an absolute blast and, and you're very good at what you do so thank you for inviting me Hey, I'm trying to live up to your standards, so I, I really do appreciate <laughs> no, that. Man. So we we no. got to keep on. Not even a power surpass, outage could stop us. Surpass your standards. Don't live up to mine. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>